she told me I had. So. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. The year is 1991. And there are three Crawfordsville citizens sitting at the breakfast tables, drinking their coffee, and reading the Indianapolis Star. And the headline in the Indianapolis Star is talking about Lily Endowment and the fact that Lily has decided that they want to build community foundations all across the state of Indiana. Now, in 1991, there were only about a dozen community foundations in Indiana. And the assets for those at that point were about $30 million altogether. Most community foundations in this country were in big cities, places like New York, Chicago. And as the grant writer at Wabash, what I knew about community foundations was we weren't going to get any money from those because community foundations can only give in their own geographic areas. We didn't have one. We had one in Marion County, and I had tried several times to explain how wonderful certain things at Wabash were and how important that might be to Marion County, but no go with that. So when we saw that they wanted to start community foundations all over the state, that was big, big news. Now, in 1991, Phil Michael was mayor of Crawfordsville. And at that point, we had, sitting on West Pike Street, a Quonset hut from World War II that was serving as the Park and Rec Department's offices and where they taught courses. And if you talk to anybody who took courses then, they'll tell you that doing aerobics on the second floor of that building was taking your life in your own hand. <laughs> But the mayor wanted us to have a good community center. So what he saw in this invitation was money for a community center. Dick Christine and I thought, yeah, that might be true. But we saw a kind of bigger picture than that. We wanted to see things that could help the community year after year after year. So we did a little safari to Indianapolis, to Lilly Endowment. And with us, um, with Dick and uh, Mayor Hayes. We took Rita Ham, who was the Park and Rec Director at the time, and we took Will Hayes, who was a former mayor of Crawfordsville, and oh, by the way, had been in the Community Development Office at Lilly Endowment before he retired. Now, from Lilly Endowment's point of view, the time for this was right. They were getting all kinds of messages from local communities who would call and say, our swimming pool's leaking, we need your help. Or we have a great new service bureau, but we don't have enough staff for this place. Or we have senior citizens who need a place to go, but we don't have a community center. So could you help us, Lily Endowment? And they were wise enough to know that in Indianapolis, they couldn't possibly know what the best use of money in Vincennes or Crawfordsville or Paoli might be. So at that point, when the invitation came out, Tom Lake, who was president of Woolley Endowment at the time, said, we believe the best way to assist Indiana communities is to help them generate local solutions to local problems. Our intention is to aid Indiana in developing a perpetual legacy of self-reliance to serve the state's communities for generations to come. Lily Endowment was not going to make it easy, by the way. They had created an initiative called GIFT, G-I-F-T, which stood for Giving Indiana Funds for Tomorrow. Each community that wanted to start a community foundation had to meet a couple of really tough criteria, which started with a community organizing committee. And that group had to incorporate, they had to create bylaws, they had to seek a 501c3 status from the, um, from the IRS, and they had to elect a first board of directors. And oh, by the way, they had to raise $3.7 million. And if they did that, Lily would match them with $1.5 million. And together, then, there would be this $5 million endowment that was supposed to be perfect, the, the kind of the bottom line for what would make a foundation successful. They would also give us technical assistance to help us figure out how to do those things. And finally, they would give us some grant money so that if we gave grants in the community, 
the community would begin to wonder, who are, who are these people? And uh, begin to pay attention. So the idea of community foundations caught fire in Indiana. And at this point, we now have in Indiana more community foundations than any other state in the union. Every one of the 92 counties in Indiana is served by a community foundation or shares with another county a community foundation. And you remember I said back in 91, the assets were uh, a total of $3 million, or $30 million for all of those 12 foundations. Now the combined assets of all the community foundations is $2 billion with a B dollars in the state of Indiana. And there have been five willing endowment gift invitations that followed that very first one. And each time, Lily has made an effort to make sure that those invitations cause the local community foundation to go out to citizens, to raise money locally, to match their money. But back to the, back to the history. Lily told us to start with an organizing committee. And we did that with several community-minded people. Those people would accomplish all those tasks I listed before, the bylaws, the incorporation, the 501c3, and the building of the first board of directors. We were very fortunate to have on that first organizing committee Will Hayes and Larry Cummings, Dick Ristine, Ken Newnham, Art Baxter, who was a plan giving officer at the college, um, Brenda Stuckey, Phil Michael, and Sandy Tanzel. And that's the group that put together the kind of the basic structure of the organization. Lily said that we had to establish an office, and with the help of Bank One, which of course now is J.P. Morgan Chase, and some low-cost furniture from Hoosier Heartland Bank, we set up an office on the third floor of Chase. As we grew, we needed more space, and we moved to the second floor of the Roger Building, which is at 118 East Main Street. And then we grew some more, and we had to have a little more space. So we moved across the street to 119 East Main, which is where we are now. And I think having our office downtown is significant and important. It, it's a presence that says we are here for this community. Lily said that we had to have at least one part-time paid officer, uh, employee. Laverne Perry was that person, and she filled that role with a smile, and a typewriter, and a telephone, and a very large card file, which is what we used to do our first fundraising with. Eventually, as we grew, we approached Ann Malott, who was half-time director of Muffy, and we said, would you like another half-time job? We need you. She said yes, fortunately, and after several years, it became too much of a job for one person to do each of those half-time. So we said, Ann, we need you. We need you full time. And she came on board as executive director. Ann retired just a few years ago. And in her place, she was followed by Kelly Taylor, who has blossomed, as you can see, into another wonderful executive director. Over the years, the, the foundation's work has required more employees. And I know that at some time tonight, those people are all going to be introduced to you. But the staff grew from that first executive director to Kelly is at seven now that we have. Okay, six. six. Can't see that far. <laughs> <laughs> She's making faces. Um, the organizing committee had lots of conversations about who that first board should be, and um, we knew that was going to be an important decision because we needed to have people in this community who the community knew and trusted because we were going to be asking for bodacious sums of money from lots of people. Um, they needed to be both city and county folks because this was the Montgomery County Community Foundation. And they needed to be people who could either contribute money or ask for money or introduce us to people who had money. This was not going to be an honorary position. This was going to be a roll up your sleeves and work hard kind of board position. After all, remember I said we had to round up $3.7 million in Montgomery County uh, to receive the endowments match. And that seemed pretty daunting. We were fortunate to have a lot of talent in that first board. Now, these are people whose names you will recognize as 
probably as the last generation, the one before ours, of community leaders. It included Mark Harris, Larry Cummings, Jenny Hayes, Esther Houston, Jane Kessler, Dan, and then in addition, you had Ruby Elliott, who is still alive and well today, Marsha, Gephardt, Ken, and myself. Initially, we had no operating cash. We didn't even have enough money in the beginning to, to get a post office box, which is really humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to be a very prestigious organization if you don't even have a post office address. But people like Will Hayes and the two banks and several corporations gave us money that first year to get us through the first year and to pay the, the, exec or the um, staff member half time. And then Lowy Endowment, the second year, kicked in with operating funds that helped us get going as a real organization. Also initially, Lowy Endowment gave us that grant money to spend in the community so that we would have our names out there and they would know who we were. Those first three grants, we made challenge grants because we thought we need to help these organizations build as well as Lowy is helping us build. So the first three grants were given to the Darlington Covered Bridge Group, to fix the roof on the bridge, the Friends of Sugar Creek for a refrigerator recycling program, and the Vanity Theater to create the entrance that they still have with the marquee out in front. So how did we meet that goal? Kelly wanted me to talk about that. As, as I look back, I think it was a miracle, really. But one of our smartest moves, I think, was to ask Ken Newham, who at that point was the trust officer for Bank One, and Marsha Gephardt, who was the trust officer for Elston Bank, to be on the board. Those two people knew as trust officers that the writing was on the wall as far as banks were concerned, that consolidation was coming, and that banks were just going to get bigger and bigger, and the um, headquarters were going to be somewhere else. They weren't going to be in Crawfordsville. And what that meant was people who had established trust funds in Crawfordsville we're going to have their trusts managed by somebody in Cleveland or Columbus or New York, who knew? And so they worked, did it legally, used the advice of Judge David Alt and Rex Hanthorn, who was there all the time helping, to transfer funds from several of the banks to the Community Foundation. And that was part of that first um, $3 million that we raised. That transfer meant that the donor's trust fund would always be managed by local people, by Crawfordsville, Montgomery County people, and that a trust department way far away, who never even knew the donor, would not be involved. And that gave us a tremendous start to the foundation. And the first fund that we transferred was the Luella Brake Trust for the Blind, which is still making grants today, all of these many years later. Another early strategy that we used was to create a way for people who didn't have lots of money to create funds. I knew, for instance, that Bill and I were never going to have enough money to give a six-figure gift to the Community Foundation. But we could maybe give $1,000 a year, and, and we thought maybe some other faculty members at Wabash could do the same thing, and other people in the community. And we could, over the years, begin to build these funds. Those funds were called pathway funds. They were kind of um, endowed funds with training wheels. You know, they weren't, weren't quite, quite full-fledged funds, but after they hit $5,000, then they could become full-fledged funds. And over the years, they've grown. Um, I don't actually know how many pathway funds have turned into real funds, but it's got, it's got to be a lot of numbers. I see Marvin shaking his head. He was somebody that's working on as the treasurer, as the uh, financial officer. Uh, as we reflect back on the 25 years, I think we have to stop and acknowledge the role that Lilly Endowment played in all of this. Not just for our foundation, but for the state of Indiana. After that first gift grant helped us establish the foundation, there have been five more gift grants, each one of them a challenge grant, and each one of them targeted to help the foundation build itself in a way that it would be here forever. The most recent one, Gift 6, has just literally just finished this past year. 
and it was designed the foundation. Uh, it was designed to help the foundation raise additional matching dollars for um, unrestricted endowments. Those are the ones where, when the money comes in, nobody is saying it has to be spent for a particular purpose, and that means that the grants committee, when the grant proposals come in, can use those unrestricted funds um, to meet those needs of the grants, as well as the funds that. They've got a proposal for a juvenile justice project. There are funds that have been set aside for that. But there are some that are just unrestricted. And, and that's helpful to a foundation because it means that they can be flexible and they can meet the needs of the future years that people may not have identified. So our foundation decided to use that 50, uh, half million dollar challenge grant by splitting it into two parts. Half of it was going to go to challenge people to give unrestricted endowment to the foundation. And the other was to challenge nonprofits in the community to establish their own funds, and then the income from those funds would come back to those organizations. They raised $283,000 plus for unrestricted endowment, and for those nonprofits, $353,000 plus was that challenge. So as I reflect on where I hoped this foundation would be 25 years ago, I really have to smile. First, I hoped they would be careful stewards of those funds that people were giving them. And the fact that we now have 174 funds in the Community Foundation tells me that people have faith and are continuing to find the foundation a place to invest. Kelly meets every year with the donors of those funds she tells them how the fund did in the last year, who received the gifts, and maybe as important as anything else, she asks what those donors think needs to happen in the community. What's going on that they're happy about? What's going on that needs improvement? Second, I hope that the foundation would move from being a reactive organization where people ask for grant money and they give them grant money to a proactive organization, which is one that sees problems in the community, gathers the data, involves the stakeholders, talks about solutions, and then makes those solutions happen through collaboration and grant making. And I see that happening in the community too in this last five years. I think spe specifically, I think about the nutrition grant that has backpacks going on on the weekends with kids whose families can't afford food. That was a product of one of these proactive activities. And some discussions we've had in the last year about homelessness, which we're still kind of mulling over because we don't quite know what to do about it. But <clears throat> the fact that all of, all of the stakeholders were there in the discussion is very important. Third, I hope that the foundation could be both a role model and a mentor for the nonprofits. Um, those nonprofits, and so many of you represent those groups here in the room, you work hard, you work on a shoestring and with little thanks or celebration for the good work that you do that makes this a humane community, a great place to live. Here too, I'm proud of the efforts of the foundation. They meet with the agencies twice a year to find out what's going on, what do they need, what help do they need, um, and to gather perspective on what, what needs to be happening to make them healthier. They co-sponsor with the Putnam County Community Foundation a series of workshops for the uh, board members, the executive heads, and the volunteers who learn about how do you write a budget, how do you cre create a good, strong board for your organization. All those skills that if you were in the business workplace you might have, but maybe not in the nonprofit sector. And they meet with every organization that is about to, to write a grant proposal so that the proposal they submit will be the strongest, best proposal it could possibly be. They have a volunteer fair every year because those nonprofits said, we need volunteers and we don't know where to get them. So every year, big volunteer fair that Montgomery County Community Foundation sponsors. So they are serving as a, a resource both for the nonprofits and also a link between the community volunteers and those nonprofits. And finally, I bet you thought this would never happen. Finally, I had hoped that
that the foundation would reach a time where we could be making a million dollars of gifts in the community every single year. And that was a big hope, especially in 1991 when we didn't have a dollar to buy a post office box. And now we are doing that. We are making a million dollars worth of gifts in this community. One measure of success of a community foundation is to think about what this, found, this community would be like without the community foundation. Just let me share with you some perspective. No rails to trails. There would be no renovations or new buildings at places like the Lou Wallace Study or the Family Crisis Shelter or the Animal Welfare League or the Trinity Mission or the Montgomery County Free Clinic or the fire stations and the equipment out at Cold Creek, Walnut Township, Wingate, New Richmond. That's just barely touching the surface of the grants that have been made. No Kanani Plaza downtown, no sunshine vans. And if we measure it by the number of people the Community Foundation has touched, well, I don't have those numbers. I'm not sure anybody does. But I would venture a guess that somehow, <coughs> either through a service provided by one of the grant recipients, or by a facility that each one of us in this room has visited, every single person in Montgomery County has been touched by this community foundation in the last 25 years. So, 25 years later, are you pleased with the Montgomery County Community Foundation? I am. You betcha.